To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have four readings today. Each of them in your own mind, maybe separate, maybe you see the overlap. But these four readings combine and swirl into a magnificent, powerful, and explosive harmony that brings the truth of God and the light of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world into one nexus that we can't miss. And once we grab onto it and we follow him and take him into our hearts, we find our own lives exploding the same way God has brought his Son into the world to bring the kingdom and to deliver it to us. We hear that Jesus learns that his distant cousin of some sort, John the Baptist, has been arrested. And John the Baptist being arrested triggers something. It triggers a series of events. And the first thing it triggers is that Jesus leaves his hometown in Nazareth and heads out to go to Galilee, and for more specifically, Capernaum in Galilee. And he goes there to fulfill the prophecy, the very prophecy we hear in our Isaiah reading today of what will come when God's Messiah comes into the world. So now we take Isaiah and we're swirling it with the gospel and we've only just begun. Because the story goes on with its power when Jesus does these things, when he goes into Galilee and gets to Capernaum. He's at a turning point. He's at a turning point in his ministry and keep that in your mind, turning points. We all have turning points and his turning point has a lot to do with your turning point and my turning points. So his turning point is that he goes out and he begins to preach to the world. And what does he preach? Get holy. Repent of what you've been doing and get holy. For the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom is coming. He starts preaching about the kingdom. And the kingdom is vital to you and me. It's vital because if we think we're in this world, living this world, we're going to have a pretty miserable life. But when you live this world in the kingdom of God and hold the kingdom in your heart, no matter what the storms may be and be swirling about you, you stand like a rock, hard, more to the very truth of God, to the power he gives us through the Holy Spirit to survive and go through those storms of life. So this kingdom is not just some fanciful theological notion. It is the very reality by which you and I are live, because it's not some fictitious, make-believe, mythical kingdom. It's a true and actual kingdom of which Jesus Christ is king. So this turning point comes. But to get himself to move to the next stage, he wants some helpers. I dare say he doesn't need helpers, he can do whatever he wants, but he wants helpers. He knows it's the higher and the better way. So he goes ahead and he calls Andrew and Peter, a couple of brothers, and says, follow me. Now here's where the word of God is important. Remember the Bible is actually foundational to your life, and these things are given to you so you can't miss the importance of the nuance. It says when he invites Peter and Andrew to come, Immediately, underscore that, all caps, bold letters, immediately, three exclamation points, immediately they drop their nets and follow him. So he moves on. He meets James and John, the sons of a man named Zebedee. He says, follow me. What do they do? Immediately, underscore, bold letters, three exclamation points, they follow him. This sounds more like the Gospel of Mark to me, because the Gospel of Mark is this very brief, action-packed thing where he's always talking about motion and action and how things happen. But even Matthew picks up on this because it was so significant. They were probably all amazed when they heard the story. When Peter and Andrew said, well, he said, come. So what'd you do, pack up and follow him a week later? No, we left right there and then. We didn't take, any, we didn't take our toothbrush, nothing. We just followed him and left our father in the boat. You gotta be kidding me. No, that's what we did. And the other guy said, yeah, that's what we did too. We did the same thing. It was so important. We could see in his face, in his eyes, in his voice, there was power of God in him. And we couldn't help but to be drawn and to follow him. So they make their turning points. That's their turning point where they go and bring things that echo down through the cars of time to you and me today. And then what do they do together when this is all done? What, is these, what do these turning points bring about? They start traveling throughout Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And while they're about Jesus is hearing, curing everybody who he comes across who needs to be cured of diseases and maladies. He didn't cure the whole world of everything. He cured those with whom he came into contact. So incredibly powerful, so incredibly fast, so you know, mind-boggling. The idea of somebody, not just somebody coming and saying, see, follow me, and you just walk off. Well, what the heck is going on here? And in response to this, I asked a question that's the name of a book that was written decades and decades ago. So then, how do we live? How do we live in light of this now that we hear this? And the answer becomes simple. 
we are to immediately follow him in our lives too. And you say, but I am following him. Look, I'm sitting here. It's Sunday morning. I got up early. Shampooed my hair. Put on my best clothes. I brought a check to throw in the plate. I'm here. I am following him. Well, I got to tell you something. I'm a priest. There's another priest over there in that chair. There's bishops around here. Well, everybody has to work on following him. We're not doing it well enough, no matter how well we do it, because we're imperfect humans. And we'll never get there this side of, of Jesus coming back. But following him is the clue to this sermon on how your life may be made more fulfilled and powerful and real, and how he's still calling you as he called Peter and Andrew and James and John, and as he calls people throughout history. For me and for so many other people, figuring out that I had to follow him in an earlier part of my life was the absolute key to my fulfillment and my joy and my happiness. Now, you say, well, are you always happy? No. I'm not always happy. Are you always joyful? I hope so. Remember, joy and happiness are two different things. Happiness is a severe subset of joy. No matter what your circumstances and the storms of life might be, you're always joyful because you know that Jesus Christ has overcome death in the grave. And we're going to live forever. And we're forgiven. And nothing can defeat us. Happiness has more to do with the circumstances around you. I'm not happy if I break my leg and it hurts, right? I'm not happy. But I still have my joy. Nothing can defeat my joy, not even a broken leg. So the Holy Scriptures combine today, all four of those scriptures, to tell us these truths. You wouldn't recognize what is true and not true if you didn't have all these scriptures coming together and agreeing with one another. They are God's greatest gift to us after Jesus himself, that we should have a means by which we can know what is true, what is good for us, what is not, what pleases God and what does not please God, what is of the kingdom of God and what is not. The word of God today is giving each of us an opportunity. It's an opportunity that we've had before and we'll have again, but it's an opportunity for a turning point. It's saying that he's calling you. Now we've all had intersections of life, we've all had crossroads, we've all had places where we have to make decisions, go left, go right, take this job, marry this person, whatever it is, we've all had intersections. But here is another one, this turning point of faith, where we are not deluded to think that the amount of faith within us is what it could be in its full potential, but to understand that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit sanctifying us, this process of sanctification, we become more and more exact followers of Jesus, seeking Him, as even the psalm we, we sang and chanted today speaks that we are seeking the Lord of God. Without the Word of God, without having this Bible to be our warning, to be our way, to be our light on everything we see, we are left to ourselves. And when we are left to ourselves, we are lost to ourselves. I tried living without the Word of God when I was younger. I tried to live without prayer. I tried to live without everything. Didn't think I need these things. And when I was left to myself, I was constantly broken, in a ditch, unhappy, unsatisfied, did not know joy. Happiness becomes a moving target where I always say on Monday you can hit the middle of the bullseye with an arrow, but on Tuesday they move it somewhere. Now where is it? I don't know where it is to hit it, but I'm off again. But when I walk in the Word of God, when I follow Jesus as He invites me to do, that bullseye sits there fat and still. And I can just nail that thing down the middle every time. Because even when I'm broken, even when I sin, even when I'm not at my best or somebody victimizes me or whatever it is, I have my joy because I'm following Him and I know I win. I would rather lose in a battle and win a war than to win a war and lose in a battle. And when I follow him, I win the war. I win the war of my soul. I win the spiritual warfare of the world. I win the war against death and the grave. I win all those things. And what the crazy bit about it is, is it says in Luke chapter 12, it's my Father's good pleasure in heaven to give me those victories, to give me his very kingdom. Why does he want to give that to me? Why does he want to give it to you? We get these things for nothing, just for following. And it's something glorious and beautiful. In our Corinthians reading today, the Apostle Paul says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. The message about the cross, the words about the cross, the scriptures, the teachings about the cross are foolishness to the world. That's ridiculous. You really believe this guy died on the cross and rose on Easter morning? What a bunch of idiots you people are. Don't you know people don't come back from the dead? Ha, 
But for those of us who have faith, for those of us who follow, we know it's the power of God by claiming that resurrection, by saying it is mine and he's given it to me, by clinging to the old rugged cross and never letting go, even with white knuckle misery, I'll hold on to that thing, it's my ticket to heaven, I get to live forever because I follow him. Jesus didn't ask me to follow him because he just had work for me to do. He asked me to follow him because he knows it's good for me. It's good for the kingdom. It's good for all of us. Salvation is multiplied and geometrically grown because we follow him. And there's his glory and our great blessing that come from that same act of just following, just so simple. This idea of looking at the Bible is so central to who we are. Bishop Desmond Tutu said this about the Bible. This is pretty cool. He said, when the missionaries came to Africa, we had the land and they had the Bible. Then they said, let us pray. And they asked us to close our eyes. But when we opened our eyes, they had the land and we had the Bible. He said, I think we got the better deal. And he's right. While I will never condone some kind of imperialistic stealing of land from the native peoples, that's a horrible thing. I understand what the good bishop says there. He had the Bible, the greatest prize. Keep your land, keep your riches, keep everything. I've got the greatest gift that God could give me. For the Bible that calls us to follow Jesus so that we may stand on the rock of who he is and walk in his light is the very foundation of my life. It's my bedrock, my standard, my litmus test. I wrote down a bunch of words here. My guide, determinant, the final arbiter of how I should live my life. For the world will tell you that things are right that are wrong, and that things are wrong that are right. And so you start swirling in your head, I've got the culture telling me this is right and wrong. I have the Bible telling me this is right and wrong. Which one do I follow? Well, that's pretty easy. You can follow the world's way and you'll be walking in foolishness and make mistakes. You'll follow the Lord's way. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians again, there were quarrels among the people because they were trying to do things their way instead of God's way. The book of Judges said that people walk around this earth Everyone doing what seems right in their own heart, instead of seeking what God says is right and doing those things. We need to ask ourselves, am I living and reflecting upon things that are of the world, or am I living and reflecting upon the things that are truly of God? And then you get into this act where you're really trying hard. I do it. I'm trying to keep my focus on God. But the world keeps sending little grenades in on me and throws these little scud missiles over my fence and tries to dislodge me. I said, Lord, I'm trying to help me out. Call, help me, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and helps me and does those things. And sometimes it happens that some worldly thing will land in your heart or in your mind. But you've got to go back and go to the Word of God. And let God treat you in a way that helps you and keeps you holy and safe and gives you that chance for joy. For your joy is robbed when you follow the ways of the, of the world. Someone once said, and I've said this to you before, you can't help it when a bird flies over your house. You can't help that. But if you let that bird build a nest in your chimney, that's your problem. That's your fault. You did that. And the same thing with the things of the world, the teachings of the world, the ways of the world that come back with following Jesus, that go head to head with the notion that I'm not going to be uh, making my turning point because I'm going to stick with the way I was in the, in the world. I can't let them lodge in my chimney. Somebody wrote something that I took down a while ago, and I've been waiting for a chance to use it in a sermon. And here's my chance. Finally, I get to use it. It's a joke of sorts, but it really makes a good point for me. I'm, I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing. And the guy wrote down, he said, Last week, a bunch of crooks broke into my house. They didn't steal my TV, but they took my remote control. <laughs> and now when I'm watching TV and I'm watching my shows, these rascals keep riding by my house and switching the channel on me. <laughs> So you think of this devious little game they play of switching a channel, like I'd go crazy with that. But if there's some little, uh, how do I say, character or some impish nature in me that would think that's kind of funny. It's a good practical joke to be switching channels on somebody. But that's how it is. You're sitting there and you're trying to focus on God, and there's something around you trying to distract you and change that channel and to get you off balance. And to remember that the Lord has called you is important. To remember that it's not what you think or what the world thinks, but what God thinks. Too many people are preaching and writing articles and teaching classes and advocating for things that make them itch, things that bug them. So they preach about it. This bothers me and this bothers them. So they write and they teach and they preach about things that make them itch. But God wants us to preach and teach and write and advocate for things that make him itch. He's worried about the things that bother him, 
Not the things that bother you or that bother me. Our minds are imperfect. Our minds are filled with things that get us astray. Remember what I said? Left to ourselves, we would be a disaster. But he helps us to follow with the things that he wants us to do like that. He's not asking us to be geniuses. He's not asking us to be theologians. He's not asking you to be a Democrat. He's not asking you to be a Republican. Thank God for that. Neither of those two. He's not asking you to make plans on your own even. He doesn't care about what plans you have. What he's saying and what is Jesus asking you to do? Follow me. That's what he's saying. Follow me. I'll take care of you. I'll make the decisions along the way. I'll tell you what's right or wrong. I'll tell you where to put your heart and what to spend your time and your money on. Follow me in my ways. So every decision you make, you're consulting me in your prayer life and in the scriptures. Every time you have a relational problem, you bring your relationship problem to me. If you have financial needs, health issues, bring them to me. And maybe you won't be cured of your sickness and you might die anyway, but you will be healed in your heart and your soul. And the death hardly matters because you're going to live forever anyway. And that's an enormous true principle to understand. If you want to follow Jesus because he'll fix your marriage, or if you want to follow Jesus because he'll give you a better life, that's idolatry. All right, that's idolatry. Follow him for the sake of himself. He is worthy in and of himself. Those are words written by a missionary leader named Paul Washer. He wrote that down, and I understand what he means. If all I want is to follow Jesus so I can get what I want, you know, get some money, get healed, you know, meet somebody, marry, whatever, all I want is what I want, but I don't want him, that's idolatry. I'm trying to idolize him for what I want. I'm using him. It's like being friends with somebody who has a swimming pool in their backyard so you can swim in their pool. You don't care about the person, right? And he doesn't want that either. What we have to do is follow him in gratitude for what he has already done. If he doesn't do another thing for me, I'm following you, Lord, because I love you. You are perfect and wonderful and holy, and you've given me life. And then when I messed up that life, you forgave me. And after you forgave me, you gave me eternal life. And then you died for me on a cross. What more do I need to follow you than that? It's really amazing. Paul points that out. Paul points it out in his reading when he says following Jesus. He says, you follow Paul? Do you say, I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas? Or do you say, finally, the right thing, I follow Christ? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? When you realize these things, you begin to, you begin to understand that Jesus is saying, follow me. He's not saying, follow some other Christian person. He's not saying, follow the church even. He's saying, follow me, which helps you to underscore this isn't religion, this is faith and relationship in the Lord God who made you, of whom you are a child, and he wants you in his holy embrace. He's saying, come and be with me. It is a person, it is this person, Jesus, who leads us in our ways and helps us to become the people he intends for us to be. Remember that when you're in the kingdom of God, you see the world through the eyes of God. But when you're in the world, you see God through the eyes of the world. You reverse it. Instead of seeing the world through God's eyes, you're looking at God through the world's eyes. And so you start crafting God to be who you want him to be. You start making him someone other than who he truly is. A man named Alan Bannister said, the turning point in your life, I've been talking about turning points, the turning point in your life will come when you stop seeing the God you want or the God you create and instead follow the God who truly is. That's the turning point in your life. When you stop this idolatrous notion and say, well, my God would allow this in society. My God would allow that. I'm going to do this. And my God doesn't care if I do that or run this or run my business this way or spend my money that way. Go ahead and keep creating your gods. That's what primitive tribes do. They call it totemism. When you have a totem pole, and you make a totem pole, you put, you know, you put an ox on there because one of the values of the tribe is strong as an ox or smart as an owl or wise as an owl or whatever it may be, you start building this pole of all these things that you worship, and you go ahead and essentially worship yourself. But he's saying, don't worship the God you create. Worship the God who truly is, who unfolds himself. And where do you learn about that? In the scriptures of God. Back to the Bible again. There's no escaping it. The Holy Word of God is the essence of who we are, the essence of our lives. In our collect today, we pray in the beginning, it says, give us grace, O Lord, to answer the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation. Give us grace to answer the call. What is the call? Follow me. The call to follow him and proclaim his kingdom 
and in ourselves find joy and fulfillment in our children, in our families, in our kitchen tables, in our workplaces, in our church, in our relationships, all this stuff starts bleeding through every little aspect of our lives. Jesus had his turning point when John the Baptist was arrested and he set forth to go out and proclaim the kingdom. The apostles had their turning point, they had their turning point when they followed him and invited them to do that. And for you and I, our turning points are when we do the same. Live our lives the way he calls us to live them. That's what I pray for you as your pastor. That's what I hope you will do is take this gospel, all four readings, take all four readings, including the gospel, home and breathe them all week long to the point where you can see how more nearly and dearly you can follow your Lord Jesus. And when you do, he will be glorified and just as much you will be blessed and fulfilled in ways unimaginable. Amen. Amen. Amen.